Welcome attorney Chris Hand, who in addition to being a former Senate press Sec secretary, speechwriter, and mayoral chief of staff, actually wrote operating instructions for the country. Literally, the book is called America, the Owner's Manual. Chris Hand, thank you so much for being here this morning. And thank you for having me. And if you have questions about what's happening inside City Hall and why Chris is here for it, give us a call at 904-549-2937 or email firstcoastconnect at wjct.org. You can also reach out via social media, be it uh, X or Facebook or Instagram. Chris, let's start off with some good news for Jacksonville. Uh, it was an announcement Monday that Jacksonville's signature downtown revitalization project, the Emerald Trail, is about to get a big chunk of change, $147 million from the federal government. Tell us where this money is coming from um, and why we're getting it. Well, and first of all, as you say, it was announced on uh, Monday. Uh, two members of Congress representing the Jacksonville area, Aaron Bean and John Rutherford, uh, sent out a press release indicating that they'd gotten notice that, this, uh, that the Jacksonville Transportation Authority and the city of Jacksonville are going to receive what's called the Neighborhood Equity and Accessibility Grant. That is something that was passed during the Inflation Reduction Act in 2022 uh, to help connect particularly underserved communities. Uh, JTA has been working on this for quite some time, trying to help bring this money in to support the Emerald Trail project as part of an overall JT effort to increase JTA effort to increase grant funding uh, for a variety of transportation priorities. Uh, so this is the second big financial tranche for the Emerald Trail. It received an initial one uh, a couple of years ago when the city council passed an enhanced gas tax here in town that uh, directed about 135 million dollars to the Emerald Trail. This net grant now provides for $147 million for design, planning, and ultimately construction of what will be a 30-mile network of trails, greenways, and parks connecting about 14 different historic neighborhoods here in Jacksonville. So this is very significant news for the Emerald Trail initiative that we've got. Now, we have not yet heard from the city or from JTA, but we have heard uh, from these two members of Congress who received the notification of grant award about this nearly $150 million. So um, this initial money that was received, you mentioned, was when the city council doubled the gas tax. So it appears, you know, we can have nice things sometimes, but it does cost money. Um, I'm curious about the politics of that. Why is it that we're hearing from two Republican lawmakers in Washington, D.C. about this allocation and not hearing from the city um, this money was pursued after an agreement between the city and Groundworks Jacksonville and the JTA last year that basically made JTA the lead on pursuing some of these federal dollars from the Biden administration infrastructure, you know, fund. Um, why isn't the mayor taking ownership or, 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 or benefiting, I guess, in some way from this announcement? I don't think we know that yet, Anne, and we'll have to see. It is somewhat curious that the city hasn't made a statement about this yet and that we've heard from the you know, from the two members of Congress. Uh, I don't know if it's because the city's waiting for, you know, an official announcement from USDOT or, you know, something else like that. Uh, the notice of grant award has gone out, and they regularly send these to members of Congress who then immediately turn around and announce them. That's been going on for decades in Congress. So uh, a little bit curious that the city has not yet said anything about that. This was one of Mayor Deegan's, she had seven priorities in her uh, inaugural address, her July 1st, 2023 inaugural address, and funding riverfront parks and completing the Emerald Trail was one of those seven priorities. So uh, perhaps we'll hear something in the in the days to come from the city, but regardless, this is a very significant grant award uh, that's going to go to the city of Jacksonville, and probably between this and the funding that was provided with that enhanced gas tax, probably provides most of the funds at this point to completely Emerald Trail. And by the way, that investment that the city council made uh, through that enhanced gas tax in the Emerald Trail, if I had to guess, was very significant in these federal dollars being awarded. Obviously, the federal government, when it's looking at these types of grant applications, wants to see, do cities have skin in the game? Have they actually invested in themselves? Those that do often have an advantage in these competitive grant processes, and I suspect that was the case with this one as well. And this project has also had really significant um, buy-in from the nonprofit and philanthropic community. We've had big donations from Vistar, the Paget family, Dolores Bar Weaver, David Miller. Um, even Swisher gave, I think, a half a million dollars to completing part of the S-Trail that's, you know, a big part of this um, it's expected to be built by 2029, and it may actually be on track. 
I want to ask you how that dovetails with some downtown development questions that have arisen. Um, you know, there have been some setbacks. We've discussed on this program a little bit in the past, but just, you know, recently, obviously the fire at the Doro Rise building was um, a loss of, you know, a step forward and then kind of two steps back. But the old Roosevelt Hotel and the, indep- the original Independent Life building right there by the federal courthouse, those have kind of been abandoned. It looks like those projects, uh, they've defaulted, I guess, the investors or the, the property owners. Um, the plan that was going to build a tower at the Jacksonville Landing appears to be on ice. Um, and then the Hardwick at the old Duval County Courthouse site. So there have been a lot of, you know, visible setbacks. Um, and then, you know, something like the Emerald Trail seems like moving forward with really, a, you know, a, a cool network to connect the ecology, the riverfront, and some struggling neighborhoods. Well, on the downtown development projects, I think it re- we really are sort of at an important pivot point uh, of this. Th- this is not to suggest, and, and maybe as some have, that downtown revitalization is, is dead or is not happening. I think the jury is out on that. But I, they ha- as you say, there have been some very notable downtown development projects that have gone off the board. You talked about the American Lions Tower that was going to be on the former Jacksonville landing site. That has now been canceled. The Hardwick property that was going to be on the former Duval County Courthouse site, that has been uh, canceled. You talked about in the western part of downtown, these historic preservation projects like the Ambassador Hotel and the old Independent Life Building. And the Laura Street Trio. Well, and that, I was just going to say, in addition to those that have gone off the board, there are a couple that are sort of in limbo right now that are a little bit in development purgatory. Those include the Laura Street Trio, which of the you know the collection of three buildings right in the core of downtown that the city of Jacksonville has been attempting to develop now for the better part of the last quarter century. A lot of time, a lot of effort, a lot of money has gone into this. Uh, In a recent column that I wrote on this subject, I suggested that it's really sort of now time to either put up or shut up on the Laura Street Trio. There's a current developer. uh, The city is now, after a very contentious process through the Jacksonville City Council uh, and the DIA, have gone back to have talks with that developer, uh, given all this time that's passed. And look, there's some risk here. These are old buildings uh, that the longer time goes on without having them redeveloped, the more likely you're going to pass a point of no return where they can't be redeveloped anymore because of the degradation of these historic buildings. So this is one that I think, particularly because it's right in the core, ought to be a priority for the city of Jacksonville. And if they can't reach an agreement Uh, with the current developer, really by the end of this month, it might be time to offer him a fair price at that point and see if you can do this development some other way. Another critical project is the one, the property right now that's owned by the related group on the site of the former River City Brewing Company, uh, right next to Friendship Fountain, which we know was recently reactivated there. This is a crucial site on the South Bank. Um, This project could be hugely impactful for downtown. And again, right now, the city appears to be sort of stuck in some negotiations with the related group. So these are two projects in particular that, if they moved forward, could have an outsized impact on the future of downtown revitalization. But right now, they're not moving forward. They seem to be stuck in neutral. So we'll have to pay very close attention to that. And of course, one other project on the South Bank is the future of the Duval County School Board building. I want to get to that in just a minute, but we've got a call, Jim from Orange Park. Uh, good morning, Jim. Welcome to the program. Hey, thanks for taking my call. I appreciate it. Hey, um, so just to, to be clear, the, the grant was under the jobs and infrastructure um, bill that was passed? It was actually under the Inflation Reduction Act. This particular program, as, you, as you're pointing out, Jim, there were two uh, very large bills that had infrastructure impacts. One was the Infrastructure and Jobs Act, that passed in 2021. The Inflation Reduction Act passed in 2022. This particular grant stems from the latter of those two legislative initiatives. Okay, that's great. Uh, my, my, I guess my point in, on this uh, is I'm pretty sure that both of those individuals, Rutherford and the other, voted against both of those. Uh, but yet, yet once again, uh, it, you know, they're taking credit probably for the fact that, hey, you know, we're getting this money. And so I agree that, you know, Donna Deegan needs to step up and say, hey, you know what, even though they voted against it, we're still getting this money. And uh, so many times I see, uh, you know, uh, Republican congressmen and senators coming back to their states after something they they voted against, uh, taking credit for it. 
So uh, that's just my point. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. Thanks, Jim. Well, just to be clear, Jim, I mean, for example, Congressman Aaron Bean just took office in January of 2023. So he was actually not a member of Congress when both the Infrastructure Bill and the Inflation Reduction Act. Uh, I believe you're correct about Congressman Rutherford, but we've seen this uh, kind of happen in a a number of parts of the country after the passage of the Infrastructure Bill uh, and the Inflation Reduction Act, including right here in Florida. Uh, After that passed, the original Infrastructure Bill directed a very large sum of money to the restoration of the Florida Everglades. Uh, And, you know, fairly quickly after that happened, a variety of members of Congress, including some who had not been supportive of the bill, uh, were, you know, kind of lauding and trumpeting and having press conferences related to this. So, I mean, it's it's really an old phenomenon in politics. And I'll borrow a line um, from uh, Ricky Bobby in Talladega Nights. When it comes to these grants, if you're not first, you're last. And so it is, I think, really important for those who have Obviously, you want to work closely with the agencies that are awarding them, and I completely understand uh, that you want to maintain protocol. But I also think very important when news like this comes out as quickly as possible to make sure, really for the benefit of citizens who are going to benefit from these projects, make sure they understand uh, you know, what has occurred here, what the impact's going to be, and how that might impact their daily lives. And if the person or the entity that is applied for and is seeking the grant doesn't tell that story, someone else is going to. Um, So to the question of the future of the Duval County School Board headquarters, there was discussion this week as to whether that building might be sold off and the district moved to somewhere in Riverside or perhaps a new building um, by the JTA, you know, superplex um, transportation hub. Why is that debate? Well, tell us what happened, first of all. Well, I think the best way to sum it up would be that meet the new uh, Duval County Public Schools headquarters, the same as the old Duval County Public School headquarters. And as you know, there's been talk for decades in this community about the fact that the Duval County Public Schools have their headquarters on the St. Johns River and really sort of prime riverfront property on the South Bank. And a lot of discussion about, you know, should they move off the river? Where could they go instead? Well, four years ago in 2020, the Duval County School Board commissioned a process to determine if they could find a new home off the river. And this took the better part of three and a half years. A lot of different sort of firms and companies bid for the opportunity to move them kind of off the headquarters and very sort of long and winding road to get to this point. But ultimately, the school board winnowed down the candidates to two. One was the Florida Blue Tower on Riverside Avenue, which, by the way, the Jacksonville Sheriff's Office is also looking at as a new administrative headquarters. That would have cost the school district about $68 million in lease payments over 20 years. And then also JTA offered to build and lease to the school board a new building on their La Villa, right next to their La Villa campus in downtown Jacksonville. That would have ultimately cost about $128 million over 20 years. School board ran the numbers, found out that they would actually be less costly, better for taxpayers if they simply stayed in their current building. So Uh, After four years and a lot of time and a lot of inputs, uh, the school boards made the decision for now to stay right where they are on the on the South Bank here in Jacksonville. I mean, we've heard for years a lot of talk about trying to get government off of the river. And yet, even as it's moved, there just seems to be more and more vacant riverfront land. So uh, is the urgency there quite in the same way it was perhaps, you know, when the Delaney administration first started advocating for clearing some of the government, you know, properties off the river? Well, that's certainly a point that some school board members brought up during the debate yesterday, that, hey, there doesn't seem to be as much activity at some of these sites. Is it really a, an urgent priority for us to make uh, this particular move? I would not be surprised, and to see the school board come back to this subject once there is a new superintendent in place, which will be the case later this year, once the current school board elections are passed us in August and November. As we move from 2024 to 2025, I wouldn't be surprised to see this debate come back up. Now's a little bit of a difficult time to be having this conversation, particularly if the math isn't working out. And we know a variety of issues like inflation have infected, uh, you know, have affected costs in this situation. So uh, I would say this is probably more of a postponement than it is an outright cancellation of this discussion. I was surprised to learn, though, that the money that they would make from that sale, whatever it would be, millions of dollars, that they couldn't use that to pay for their new digs wherever they end up. There's some limitations on the use of these kinds of dollars uh, under the law. 
Uh, you can use them for building maintenance and those types of things, but can't uh, you know use them to pay for the cost of a new building. I think that was really a game changer in this discussion. Uh, the school board and the Duval County Schools were really counting on the proceeds from selling this building to help mitigate the costs of a new building. When they found out that they couldn't transfer that over, at that point, the costs of a new building were competing with instructional costs, paying teachers, providing for students, and the school board ultimately decided that those were their priorities, not investing taxpayer dollars in a, a new headquarters. We've got a call, John, on the south side. Welcome to First Coast Connect. Uh, well, good morning, Ann and Chris, and thank you for taking my call. You know, I just want to start off with a little jingle. You know, follow the Emerald Trail, follow the Emerald Trail, follow the Emerald Trail. We're paying the tax, the wonderful, wonderful tax. So we doubled our gas tax, and now we're, you know, we're getting a federal, you know, grant. But, uh, you know, when it comes to the, the Emerald Trail and, you know, uh, and just connecting all these various neighborhoods, you know, I just get back even to the waterways component, and you were just talking about the school board property. You know, in 2016-18 was the legislation that was a fine grant that got moved to a CIP that created that kayak launch, you know, that's right in the back uh, on the water. But uh, what I want to share with you tonight or today is that there's going to be a meeting at the Ed Ball building, you know, concerning the old armory. And, you know, um, that's going to be at 3 o'clock, and then there's another meeting tomorrow. And so, you know, Chris and Ann, you know, with all these different projects, you know, the real key component is the public having access to these various projects, especially if they're tied into the waterways. Now, I go to back to 2013, 384. That was the initial um, dollar that was going to be given to the armory, you know, back then in 2013. And, and at that meeting, I asked the uh, developers, you know, would you allow public access to Hogan's Creek? The answer was yes. And uh, ultimately, the legislation got withdrawn. But going forward, you know, Chris, Ann, can you just talk about, uh, and you're going to have the Riverkeeper on later, you, you know, uh, you know uh, where, you know, they're at JU. Can you and, or I just access waterways at JU? John, I appreciate your uh, feedback. John Nooney, of course, a huge advocate for river access for many, many years. Um, and that is one thing that this trail would do. It would kind of connect some disadvantaged neighborhoods to the water, which is important for people to appreciate the resource and kind of um, understand its significance in the environment and the, and the economy of Florida. Well, that's right. And first of all, I mean, John makes a, a very uh, important case about the importance of effective citizenship and involving citizens in the process. I know from my time at City Hall that John is a uh, very active uh, participant in the city process himself, particularly on these waterways issues. But that's exactly right. I mean, part of the goal of the Emerald Trail is to make sure that there is significant access to uh, not only the St. John's River, but various tributaries uh, that kind of go through these historic neighborhoods that are affected. So the very access that John is talking about is sort of the point of the Emerald Trail project, which again now looks like it has the funding to be able to, you know, if not totally complete the project, come very close to it. So I want to shift gears a little bit and just talk about what's happening in City Hall in terms of the power dynamics. Um, you've written about this on your blog, um, you know, the City Council maybe trying to set its own agenda separate and distinct from the mayor's and those being maybe competing visions as opposed to one that is coalescing around sometimes very similar issues. What's interesting, Ann, is when you compare the city council's priorities to the mayor's priorities, and the mayor has been very clear about her. She listed those seven priorities in her inaugural address. Council more recently has been pretty clear about its priorities. It goes through a strategic planning exercise, and a lot of the items there are in common. Uh, the current city council president, Ron Salem, has prioritized sports tourism, uh, which is an economic development goal, which is not incompatible with some of the economic development goals of the Deegan administration. Uh, councils also talked about the importance of addressing affordable housing and homelessness and to set up a new committee and some new funding sources to address that. Uh, Mayor Deegan uh, has made that a priority and actually has a staffer who's focused almost exclusively on that in her office. Uh, a variety of other goals, whether it's food security, or some of the other priorities the councils are taking. So there's actually a lot in common between the two agendas. What we're just not seeing right now 
is sort of unity around those goals. We're seeing some back and forth between the city council and the mayor's office, but not agreement on the goal. So there's certainly potential there for the two bodies to sort of come together and reach agreement. Uh, but right now that hasn't happened yet. They seem to be sort of at different corners of the ring. Why is that a problem and who do you fault for it? Well, I think like any working relationship, it's a two-way street, and there's always steps that people on both sides uh, of that particular relationship can take uh, to improve it. I think there's, I think one of the things that many people would like to see happen is to have this debate be over policy ideas and governing approaches as opposed to some of the issues we have seen. It is a, this is a push-pull that's existed ever since consolidation began to some extent where you have we have a strong mayor system under our consolidated model uh, the mayor is the chief executive officer of the city the charter could not be more clear about that um, but city council at times obviously has a vital oversight role in the process it's responsible for passing the city budget but at times you you see some conflict over the way those powers balance and we've seen that uh, in in obviously in recent months and the city council you know, after the mayor's office had a single source contract to hire a federal lobbyist and grant firm, city council then passed legislation to say they can't do that. If there's a single source, it has to come through the city council. They also made some changes to the mayor, the, you know, the executive branch's ability to settle lawsuits uh, against the city. So there have been some of those sort of issues over which branch has the power, when in fact, I think the conversation that a lot of people would like to see is, is the is the competition of ideas over how to move the city of Jacksonville forward? Um, our colleague A.G. Gankarski has written about this quite elego eloquently, talking about the need for you know both sides of the fourth floor of City Hall to come together and find some shared sustainable solutions and sort of not waste this moment. So I think there's a lot of interest in hey, it's okay. There's going to be a natural competition at times between these two co-equal branches of government. But maybe let's have the competition be over what are the ideas to help move Jacksonville forward. You mentioned A.G. Gankarski. We had him on yesterday. I was fascinated to learn you guys were classmates. I didn't know that. Well, we weren't classmates, but we went to we were in high school at the same time. He went to Bishop Kinney. I went to Fletcher. But we've known each other since 1990. So I have now known A.G. for almost uh, 35 years at this point and count myself as very lucky. He does a lot of uh, great reporting and did a great job on the show yesterday summarizing the legislative session. Well, we're so lucky to have you as well, Chris Hand. Um, thank you so much for sharing your wisdom about what's happening in local government, and we really like these monthly visits. Look forward to seeing you next month, Dan.